Admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today's video we are going to do another Netflix series review and that is on the Night Stalker series, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. It is a four part episode, each about 40 to like an hour long and I am going to put a disclaimer. If you are triggered by any of the topics that we are going to be discussing, such as sexual violence, murder, etc., then this is your chance to exit out of the video. I will not take it to heart. I'd rather you be at peace at mind and not have it be a mental toll on you than for you to just watch one of my videos. So please, if it's a trigger for you, exit out right now. Now that I've put out the disclaimer, let's dive right into the video. The Night Stalker was around 19 1985 in LA, California, and it was a crazy time to be in LA because you just didn't know who he was going to attack next. LA was glamorous, but if you went around to the other side, LA could be a very dark place. But a little bit of background story for him, Ricardo Ramirez or Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas, and his father was a police officer. He was one out of five. And as I mentioned, his father was a policeman. And I know the irony does not escape me right there because, you know, his father was a police officer and then he ended up being a murderer, so <laughs> yeah. His father had a lot of anger issues and he did tend to abuse the entire family. So he had a whole toxic relation with his family and a father. Because of this, he spent a lot of time with his cousin Miguel, who was an army vet from the Vietnam War. So now you're thinking, okay, he's gonna have like this normal childhood and he's going to experience some sort of a normalcy. No, not at all. It was far from it. His cousin Miguel showed him pictures about his rapes in Vietnam. He thought that that was appropriate to show a 10 year old. Yeah, beyond me. He even showed Ramirez a picture of one of his rape victims who he had decapitated afterwards. Again, I don't know why he thought that was appropriate to show a 10 year old, but he did. In addition to that, he showed him a couple of tactics in order like to kill people. Again, don't know why he thought that was appropriate. Why a 10 year old should have that kind of knowledge is beyond me. I don't know why he thought that but he ultimately ended up teaching him that, so yay. Miguel ends up getting into an argument with his wife and he thought that the best course of action to resolve this argument was to shoot her in the head. He ended up shooting her and only served about four years because he pleaded in sanity. Because of this, Ramirez ends up spending more time with his sister and brother-in-law, so you're thinking, okay, like he's going to have a sense of a normal life, he's going to experience what a normal family is, and he's going to leave all of that toxic stuff that he had experienced with his own family and his cousin behind and not even bring it with him into the future. No. <laughs> His brother-in-law was a peeping Tom and would take Ramirez out with him in order to join in in the escapades. So these were the two men, or three if you count his father, that were forming Ramirez into what he was ultimately going to become. Normally when you have these type of documentaries, it tends to glorify the serial killer and not really focus on the victims and what happened to them. Like that part of the story gets lost and everybody just tends to focus on the background of the serial killer. But with the Netflix series, it is the complete opposite. You don't even get to see Ramirez until like the last episode where they start revealing a bunch of stuff about him. So I thought that was a very unique way to go about in telling the story, as well as telling it from the perspective of the detectives, Frank Salerno and Gilberto Carrillo, and of course, of some of the survivors, some of the children that survived his abuse, and the family members of the victims. You do get a couple of quotes and a couple of pictures here and there in the first couple of episodes, but like I said, you don't really see him and it doesn't really focus on him until the very last episode. And the story is told from the perspective of the detectives and they get really candid about their experience, how messed up the entire situation was and how much of a toll it was beyond just the professional level. Pressure was on to stop the madman that was doing all this. 
One of them even mentioned that they would go about their home and clearing it out with a gun because that's how paranoid they were. And you can really tell just from that statement how tense the situation was in LA at the time because you didn't know who he was going to attack next. Another one mentioned how they would go out every single day to drink right after work because that's how stressed they were trying to figure out who this killer was and trying to put an end to it. Like just imagine seeing the crime scene, seeing the victims and what he was doing to them. Like that can take such a mental toll on anybody. So if you're seeing this day in and day out, just it can just affect your psyche so much. If you've ever watched any shows like Criminal Minds, NCIS, or any show on IDTV, you know that the number one thing or one of the things that police officers and detectives do is come up with a profile. A profile is based on behaviors and patterns of said killer, whether it's something that they leave behind, mental, emotional, or physical. They come up with a profile in order to just narrow down their search and give the public some information so that they can be a vigilant and help figure out who the killer is. The profile also helps the police officer and detectives to kind of like predict the killer's his or her next move. So a profile is a very good thing to have for them. Said profile also can help predict the killer's his or her next move. So it is very essential to the case to have an accurate profile. However, the problem was with this case is that they couldn't profile Ramirez whatsoever. Anyone could be a victim. He went after old people, young people, men, women. It's unheard of. We've never encountered anybody like that in criminal history. He did not discriminate against any type of like gender or age. He was murdering, raping young boys, young girls, women, men. Anybody was game. It was a free-for-all for him. So it was really hard to pinpoint who he was going to kill because he was just killing everybody and anybody. The series does a really good job at kind of giving you a sense of what it was like to be in the Night Stalker era. Everybody was talking about it. I'm scared. I think everybody else is scared. It's a cruel... Pressure was on. Because it was a very high tense, high alert, type of situation. Everybody was paranoid. They were thinking that they were going to be the next victim because again, they couldn't tell who he was going to kill next because he was killing everybody. Try to picture your local news anchor telling you every single night, hey, this is a reminder for you to lock your windows, lock your doors because you do not want the night stalker to come in and be the next victim. Like that's how bad the situation was in LA during that time. As I mentioned earlier, the story is also told from the perspective of the survivors as well as the family members of the victims. One in particular, they did interview one of the little girls that he did her. Her name is Anastasia and she remembers vividly what he did to her and what she would tell him. She would say, ow, that hurts, why are you doing this to me? This hurts and she would tell him that she needed to use the bathroom in order to have him stop the abuse. And once he figured out that that's what she was doing, he would no longer let her go into the bathroom. He would just continue the abuse, which was disgusting. The things that this man did to his victims is beyond your imaginations. Like he cut them, mutilated them, decapitated a couple of them. It was just horrible and gross. He even went as far as gouging one of his victims eyes out because she managed to untie herself, grab a shotgun and when he came back into the room she pulled the trigger. The problem was the gun was not loaded so once she pulled the trigger and nothing came out he got really mad and that's when he decided to gouge her eyes and he ended up taking them in her jewelry box as a token. What pissed me off the most, aside from like the fact that he was murdering and just people in general and just had no regard for human decency, was the media outlet and the authorities. What I mean by that is there's one particular news anchor. Her name is Laurel Erickson. I hate her. 
Okay, she is just you are not it. I don't even know how you could still be a news anchor. I don't know if she's still, you know, practicing in her career because what she did was ethically and morally wrong. I don't know if it was particularly her who found out information about the case or if it was a colleague of hers or somebody in the company, but she found information and instead of giving it to the police willingly, she blackmailed them. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that correctly. She blackmailed the police officers. And how did she go about that? I'll tell you. She got in contact with them and said, hey, I have information that you might find interesting that is pertinent to the case of the Night Stalker. But I want to have an exclusive right to an interview once you catch him. If you don't provide this for me, well, guess what? I'm not going to give you the information. This woman was willing to sabotage a murder case or cases I should say just so that she could get an exclusive right to interview Ramirez so that she can have ratings for her news channel her company or what have you like that is so disgusting and vile like how could you do that like that I don't understand how she thought that that was okay to do. The thing is, the thing that kills me the most is that she was in this series and had no remorse about the whole thing. She was like, oh, just imagine the ratings. In addition to having Laurel Erickson, you know, just trying to sabotage the keys and blackmailing the police officers here, you had the mayor of San Francisco, who at the time was Diane Feinstein, just letting out information willy-nilly about the case. And what I mean by that is Ramirez had traveled all the way to San Francisco, committed another murder, and when the officers in San Francisco figured out that the ballistics and the shoe print were a match to the cases in LA, she thought it would be appropriate to let the news media know that the Night Stalker was up in San Francisco and on top of that that the shoe print that was found in San Francisco is similar to the one in LA which was the only solid proof that they had of this of the killings because he wasn't leaving no DNA or nothing like that the only thing that he was leaving behind were shoe prints there was one instance where he tried to go into the Rodriguez family, I believe. I woke up to a very loud noise to which I responded, John, and immediately I knew it wasn't John. Into their home and because they were awake or something happened, he didn't go in ultimately, but he left his shoe prints in their like little gardening area, which was a perfect match. That's how they were able to figure out what type of shoe where did it come from, what brand, what size, etc. So that's where, that was their only lead at the time. And for Diane Feinstein to let that out just willy-nilly, like she was sabotaging the case because what happens with that? When you let out important information like that out to the news media, it's not a good idea because you are giving what you know, your knowledge, to the killer or the person committing the crime. You're tipping them off, basically. So essentially, when Ramirez heard this, guess what he did, guys? He threw away his shoes. So there goes their lead, and the police officers, again, are back at square one. Ultimately, they were able to like kind of pinpoint who he was, and they had missed him at a, a dental appointment. Out of all places to catch him, right? by like five days. However, one of the detectives, Gilberto Carrillo, he actually grabbed a copy of the x-rays and went to a friend of his who happened to be a dentist and said, what can you tell me from this? Is he gonna be able to come back? His friend told him, yes, he's in severe pain. He's gonna come back really quick. And if he doesn't, I will be in shock. So that's how they were able to pinpoint who Ramirez was. And they were ultimately able to catch him and that was thanks to a bunch of neighbors because the way that he figured out that the jig was up was when he was coming back from Arizona and saw his picture. He saw a bunch of ladies calling him El Matador, El Matador, saying that that's the killer, that's the killer. 
and like I said, he knew the jig was up and started running and that is when people started to recognize that he was a night stalker and they started running right after him and enclosed him. When the police officers knew what was happening, they were trying to get to them before like a whole lynching happened. And that's when you start hearing a little bit of like what um, Ramirez was thinking at the time because they did interview him. And he ended up saying, oh, I don't think these people would have been so brave enough had I had a pistol. Like, the audacity of this guy is beyond me. The court proceedings started and it was a spectacle, just like the Manson's murders uh, hearings were. Frequently disrupting the proceedings by displaying satanic signs and shouting obscenities at the judge. This trial is a joke. This was no different. He was just relishing in the fact that he was very notorious and all of the news media coverage that he was getting. He just loved the attention and he would walk in with shades and just put on a whole show when he would go up to court. He would walk in with a pentagram on his hand and saying, Hail Satan. It was just, it was a spectacle to say the least. And what I just find mind boggling out of everything is how he was getting love letters. He was getting like fan mail, ladies sending new pictures of themselves, professing their love to him, showing up to court in support of him. Like, what? What? You ladies are crazy. Y'all are fucking nuts. That was just very similar again to the Manson murders, Ted Bundy, and even like notoriously right now, the R. Kelly cases where these girls would just show up in support of him. Like, fuck. What the fuck? Like, I, it kind of borderlines to me more of like on the Stockholm syndrome because like there's no other way of explaining why these women would profess their love for a serial killer like it just doesn't make sense whatsoever the series was phenomenal i mean it took a while to pick up its pace but once you got to the fourth episode you were really invested in the series and it just really did a good job at depicting what kind of a monster this man was and just the whole spectacle that came about it. It just like, like I said, like I didn't, I don't understand how these women fell in love with him because this man was not pretty. And just taking the physicality part away, this dude was like the least hygienic person ever, hence why he had such bad teeth and just looked like a freaking monster when he would smile. And so just taking that away, like the personal hygiene and not being the most attractive person and oral hygiene, he murdered and mutilated people as young as children. So I just can't comprehend why these women would be in love with him and be fangirling over him. He even got married to one of his like, fangirls which again mirrors similar to the Manson cases where both Manson was I think he had a girlfriend or a wife at one point while after the cases and even Tex Watson also like he married somebody like why ladies why I, I, I don't understand that is it for today's video I hope that you did enjoy my review of the Night Stalker the hunt for a serial killer Netflix series if you did give it a thumbs up and don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you can join our hermosa familia and i will catch you guys in the next video bye